drama here. Um, there is also a significant U.S. In, uh, interest in Panama because they want to, they well, essentially they want to build a canal because they want to have an easier connection between U.S. possessions in the Caribbean and the Pacific. Um, but the problem was that there was a pre-existing treaty between the U.S. and Britain. It was called the clayton Bulwer Treaty. And what this said was that if there was a canal built in Central America, that it would be under joint U.S. and British control. And so the U.S. is able to actually sign a new treaty with Britain in 1901. It's called the hay Poncefort Ponce 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 Treaty. And what this does is it allows the U.S. to build a canal alone. So this shows us um, how much more influence the U.S. has over Britain. It shows us that the Monroe Doctrine is very successful in limiting other European influences over, uh, over Latin America. Um, <clears throat> and uh, what's going to happen, well, what, what is also happening here is that Panama is actually currently controlled, at this point it's controlled by uh, Colombia. Um, they control the entire isthmus of Panama, and um, when, even though the U.S. gets... Uh, this treaty to allow it to build a canal, Colombia is still standing in its way, and they're refusing to agree to the U.S. terms to dig the canal. So Colombia keeps demanding money from the U.S. Uh, to dig the canal, um, and what Roosevelt does, he's president at this point, is he orchestrates a revolt for Panama's independence in 1903. He kind of feels like if he can rouse up the citizens of Panama to drive the Colombians out, then that will give the U.S. the ability to start constructing the canal. So there is this Panama Revolt, which is heavily supported by the U.S. Navy, and it succeeds almost immediately. So um, now the new Panama government, uh, since it got so much help from the United States, it uh, signs a treaty with the U.S., and it's called the, the Hay Bono Varia Treaty. And what this does is it guarantees the U.S. all rights over the 51-mile-long and 10-mile-wide canal zone to be under U.S. protection. And so this allows the construction of the Panama Canal. Um, so uh, the construction starts in 1904. It's completed in 1914. Um, hundreds of laborers are going to lose their lives in the effort to build the canal. Um, and also you're going to see that many Latin Americans are resentful about U.S. tactics to, uh, to secure the canal zone. Um, and so the U.S. attempts to appease Latin Americans about this um, over time. So in 1921, Congress actually agrees to pay Colombia an indemnity of $25 million because it lost, lost Panama. And then um, the long-term effect is that in 1999, the U.S. returns the canal zone to Panama because there's all this bitterness about the about the earlier treaties that are signed that give U.S. jurisdiction over this region. So over time, uh, Panama is going to reassert sovereignty over this region. But you can see that, I mean, from the, uh, basically during the entire 20th century, the U.S. is ultimately uh, controlling Panama. <clears throat> so uh, Theodore Roosevelt is, as we know already, he's a U.S. nationalist. He is a pro- imperialist, um, and uh, Roosevelt is going to be responsible for extending the Monroe Doctrine to very much, again, um, influence the U.S. US involvement over the Latin American region and to try to discourage European influence over the region. So at this point in history, there actually were a lot of Latin American nations that owed a lot of money to European nations. And many Latin American nations are unable to pay off their debts. And uh, occasionally, European creditors are going to try to take aggressive military action to try to force these Latin American countries to pay off their debts. So there are two examples of this. Um, one example is that uh, there was this border dispute between Britain and Venezuela. And in 1902, Britain dispatched warships to Venezuela to try to force the country to pay off its debts. And another thing uh, that happens is that in 1904, uh, European powers get ready to invade the Dominican Republic for the same reason. And so Teddy Roosevelt doesn't like the idea that you have these European countries that are trying to exert military force over Latin America. And so he extends the, Ro the, the Monroe Doctrine, and this is called the Roosevelt Corollary to the Monroe Doctrine. And basically what this says is that instead of having European nations intervene in Latin America, if they owe debts, um, the U.S. would intervene instead. 
So the U.S. basically says that it's going to send uh, gunboats to Latin American countries that are delinquent and paying their debts. Um, the U.S. then would occupy the country's major ports and manage debt collection of customs until European debts were satisfied. So this is an example of gunboat diplomacy, again, using military intimidation to try to get what they want from nations. We already know that the U.S. used gunboat diplomacy to try to coerce Japan to enter into an agreement with them. We talked about that in an earlier video. Um, so basically, over the next 20 years, the US, US, future U.S. presidents are going to use the Roosevelt Corollary to justify sending U.S. forces uh, throughout Latin America, including Haiti, Honduras, the Dominican Republic, and Nicaragua. And the Roosevelt Corollary actually results in really poor relationships between the U.S. and all of Latin America. <clears throat> Roosevelt is also known uh, for... Uh, what's called big, big stick diplomacy. Um, you can see that Teddy Roosevelt is much more aggressive in terms of foreign policy when compared to uh, William McKinley, who was president before him. So Roosevelt actually was not elected at first. He was McKinley's vice president, but in 1901, McKinley is assassinated by an anarchist, and then Teddy Roosevelt is sworn into office. And so when he articulates his, uh, his foreign policy, he says, that he that his motto is to speak softly and carry a big stick. So this articulates his much more aggressive foreign policy. Um, Roosevelt is attempting to build the reputation of the U.S. as a world power. Um, and uh, critics are actually accusing him of breaking the tradition of non-involvement in global politics. So it's important to realize that not everyone is in support of big stick diplomacy, but at the same time, you see that Roosevelt's still going to use this, and Roosevelt is going to really uh, increase the U.S. influence, uh, especially over Latin America, um, but also you're going to see that um, there's going to be an interest in other countries farther away as well. Um, let's talk about China. <clears throat> so at this point, we already know that there's, um, just like with Japan, there's uh, definitely a social Darwinistic approach uh, between the U.S. and, uh, and Chinese. Um, we already know that within the United States, um, the U.S. Um, very much was trying to restrict the rights of Chinese Americans. So in 1887, this is a, actually a review, we discussed this in a previous unit, but in 1887, the U.S. passes the Chinese Exclusion Act, which uh, suspended Chinese immigration. Basically, it was a response to increased tension between working class white Americans and chi the Chinese working class. The idea was that the Chinese immigrants were effectively stealing their jobs. Um, so what's important about the Chinese Exclusion Act is it was actually the first U.S. law that ever prevented a specific ethnic group from immigrating to the U.S. So it's very much a violation of civil liberties among the Chinese immigrants. It also is challenging the 14th Amendment. So um, the U.S. interest in China abroad is also um, significantly expanded um, during the age of imperialism. So the open door policy um, is articulated by uh, McKinley's secretary of state. His name was John Hay. And so what's happening is already China is weakened by political corruption as well as a failure to monetize or modernize rather. Um, so they're going to be all already all these outside countries such as Russia, Japan, Great Britain, France, and Germany, and they're all establishing what are called spheres of influence over China. So you can see that in this chart here. You see that there are all these different European regions that are stepping in and trying to exert their direct control over um, these regions of China. So again, um, the spheres of influence, all of these places are areas where these respective countries tried to dominate trade and investment in their sphere and shut out competitors. So the idea was that, you know, you have like France is, is trying to basically monopolize trade in southern China. And then you have Britain trying to monopolize control over central China as well as the Tibetan plateau. Japan trying to exert influence in northern China. And then Russia trying to exert influence over Manchuria. Um... But what John Hay wants to do is get the U.S. involved in this. They kind of feel like these spheres of influence are shutting out the U.S. access to Chinese trade. And so he writes a letter to all these European nations asking for an open door policy. And what the open door policy was, was that all nations could have equal training privileges in China. And what's interesting is that no European nation actually explicitly rejected the open door policy. So Hay basically declared that therefore 
all these nations accepted it. And so the, the open door policy applies, and now the U.S. can effectively justify getting involved in Chinese trade. Another thing that's in, um, contributing to the increasing influence over China is that there is a lot of political unrest in China. Um, in 1900, um, there's going to be this, uh, well, there's a rise already of nationalism and xenophobia in China. Already you have significant foreign influence over China in the opium wars of the late 19th century. And so there's going to be this organization that forms um, called the Society of Harmonious Fist. And they're nicknamed the Boxers. So it's uh, Chinese nationalists. And what they're doing is they attack foreign settlements. They murder dozens of China, uh, Christian missionaries in China. Um, so basically they're, you know, they're displaying a significant threat to the foreign presence in China. And so um, there's going to be this international force, which includes U.S. soldiers, but other European soldiers as well, that march into Peking or Beijing, and they crush the Boxer Rebellion. Um, also, the international force uh, makes China pay a huge sum in indemnities that further weakens China. So you see that the Boxer Rebellion is a total failure, and uh, the um, U.S. and other European nations uh, essentially take advantage of this political unrest in China to, uh, to expand their control over the region. And so... All these examples show us that the U.S. is really becoming a Pacific power now. Um, this map is going to show you all these different areas that become U.S. possessions during the uh, mid to late 19th century. So effectively, you have the U.S.'s ability to establish naval bases throughout the Pacific. Um, this is also going to have significant uh uh, future effects. If you think about the U.S. involvement in both World War I and World War II, they're going to have increasing access to the Pacific for military reasons during these wars, which could be one of the reasons why the U.S. ultimately does experience success in the Pacific theater. <clears throat> but also, it's going to contribute, obviously, to tension between Asian countries, Japan specifically, and, um, and the U.S., um, and we know that really culminates with the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Um... So the U.S. has very much taken on a new role um, as it expands its imperialistic influence. This cartoon is called The Cares of a Growing Family, and here you see President William McKinley, and he is sitting on the soapbox. He is pondering the merit of acquiring territories, because we know that McKinley was at first torn about imperialism. Um, and you see that these children, so to speak, are... Um, are representing the inferior peoples of non-Caucasian origins. What's significant is that all these people, um, all these different countries are represented as children and they're also represented as pygmies. And so basically this shows us that as far as the U.S. was concerned, um, these countries were inferior humans. This is very much representing social Darwinism here. Um, so the president sits there and reflects about the advantages or disadvantages of occupying these territories. And what really we see happening is that while the president is sitting here reflecting, there's going to be an increased affirmation of public opinion favoring annexing non-white people. <clears throat> this cartoon is called Constable of the World. This shows Teddy Roosevelt here. And um, he is, again, he has this, he has this big stick. Um, he is using what is called the new diplomacy to effectively police the world. So, you know, the, the idea of big stick diplomacy means that uh, the U.S. is going to have an increasing role in actually intervening directly in foreign affairs. Um, and Roosevelt really demonstrates a significant shift towards a more aggressive approach in other places. Um, Teddy Roosevelt also wins a Nobel Prize. Um, for his involvement um, in ending the Russo-Japanese War. Um, so let's talk about that for a second. So at the beginning of the 20th century, you're going to have a uh, significant tension between Japan and Russia. Um, both Japan and the U.S. Uh, were relatively new at the um, as imperialistic powers in East Asia. And um, the relationship between the U.S. and Japan is going to get increasingly competitive during Theodore Roosevelt's presidency. But also, abroad, you have this uh, imperialist rivalry between um, Russia and Japan. We already saw that in the map of spheres of influence previously. Basically, um, Russia wants to build a railroad in Manchuria, but Japan is also challenging Russia's uh, influence over Manchuria. And so this rivalry between Russia and Japan causes them to go to war in 1904. And uh, Russia actually loses the war against Japan, which is um, a huge upset for them. 
they're really astonished that a non-Western country is able to defeat them. And this also shows you Japan's rise into, you know, it very quickly goes from isolationist to very much involved in international affairs. And it proves that it's a strong and worthy military uh, contender. Um, so when the war is ending, Teddy Roosevelt organizes the peace conference, and it takes place in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And uh, the Treaty of Portsmouth that is drawn up formally ends the Russo-Japanese War. Um, but Japanese nationalists are actually upset with the U.S. because they feel like the U.S. doesn't give Japan all that they thought they deserved from Russia. So it shows you that the U.S. is still, um, in a way, kind of favoring its relationship with the European nation. And you can see that the Treaty of Portsmouth is going to you know, contribute to increasing um, tension be between the U.S. and Japan. But nonetheless, the, US, uh, the Treaty of Portsmouth actually uh, gets Teddy Roosevelt to win the Nobel Prize in 1906. <clears throat> when William Howard Taft becomes president, you, you're going to see that his uh, foreign policy is actually much weaker than Teddy Roosevelt's. Um, he definitely does not implement a big stick diplomacy. He implements what's called dollar diplomacy, <clears throat> which basically means that he feels like um, U.S. involvement in foreign countries should be much more economic in nature, that, um, that we should think more about uh, private investments in foreign nations and not so much military intervention. And so what William Howard Taft is doing is he's promoting U.S. trade by supporting American enterprises abroad. So that's what dollar diplomacy is, right? Um, <clears throat> so dollar diplomacy applies in both East Asia and Latin America. Um, in Asia, let's talk about first, um, Taft thinks that, well, first there's this, um, significant interest in building railroads throughout China. So Taft actually is encouraging private American financial investment in China. Um, and it believes that it's going to lead to better political stability there. And also it will promote U.S. business interests. Obviously by building railroads, it's going to be able to, uh, facilitate trade throughout the region. Um, but there's going to be growing anti-imperialism both in the U.S. and overseas. And so this is going to contribute to a major obstacle to his policy. So um, Taft does secure an agreement for American participation in railroad investments um, in 1911 in China. But the U.S. is actually going to eventually get excluded from building railroads in Manchuria because there was um, already you have a Russian and Japanese influence over the region. Um, so this is actually seen as a violation of the open door policy in China. Um, Russia and Japan actually agreed to treat Manchuria as a jointly held sphere of influence. So we see that despite the Russo-Japanese war, um, at this point, the Russians and uh, the Japanese actually are agreeing with one another about having influence over Manchuria to effectively keep the U.S. out. And then in Latin America, we see that Taft is implementing uh, dollar diplomacy to justify getting involved in Nicaragua. And so the U.S. Uh, starts to get involved in Nicaragua's financial affairs in 1911, um, basically because the U.S. has significant uh, um, investments in Nicaragua. Um, so there was a civil war that broke out in Nicaragua in 1912, and so the U.S. sends um, mariners there to try to stop it. And the mariners remain there until 1933. So we see, again, um, basically dollar diplomacy means that the U.S. is going to get increasingly involved in regions when it feels like it's business business interests are at stake. So uh, Taft's dollar diplomacy is not particularly successful. He very much doesn't measure up to his, uh, to his predecessor, Teddy Roosevelt. Um, now let's move on to Woodrow Wilson's policies. Um, <clears throat> Woodrow Wilson um, was a Democrat, so we are uh, finally sort of breaking the long-standing chain of Republican presidents in the White House. When he campaigned in 1912, he called for a new freedom in government. Basically, he promised that he would take a more moral approach to foreign affairs. In a lot of ways, we see that he is applying progressive policies to foreign policy uh, to his foreign policy, and we'll talk about the progressive era soon. Um, so basically, he claimed that he opposed imperialism and big stick uh, and dollar diplomacy of all of his Republican predecessors. The idea of moral diplomacy um, was also shared by uh, William Jennings Bryan, who was Wilson's Secretary of State. And so basically, moral diplomacy pledged to respect other nations' rights, and that would in turn support the spread of democracy in these regions. Basically, Wilson was trying to correct what he thought as the wrongful policies of all of his Republican predecessors. But nonetheless, despite... Um, actually, let me go back to this for a second. Despite um, 
Wilson's policy of moral diplomacy, you actually see that he does very much intervene militarily in, uh, in this is especially in the Caribbean region. And so his policy of democracy and anti-colonialism definitely does not extend into Mexico, Central America, or the Caribbean. He actually goes well beyond both Roosevelt and Taft in his use of U.S. Marines to try to straighten out financial and political troubles in the region. So he keeps Marines in Nicaragua. He orders U.S. troops into Haiti in 1915. And then he orders U.S. troops into the Dominican Republic in 1916. But his argument is that such an intervention was necessary to maintain stability in the region and to protect the Panama Canal. So he's not arguing that, like, it's not a social Darwinistic argument in his mind. He actually thinks that he's protecting the people. Um, so that's how he justifies it. But nonetheless, in a way, it's kind of going against, uh, you know, the whole idea of moral diplomacy because he's not really encouraging peace in the region per se, I guess one could say. So in the 1910s, there's going to be a revolution and civil war in Mexico. Um, so <clears throat> at this point, there was um, a military dictatorship uh, led by General Victoriano Huerta. Um, in 1913, he seized power by having the democratically elected president killed. And so there's this huge threat of despotism in Mexico that Wilson wants to intervene in. Um, so basically... Uh, what this demonstrates is that despite um, Wilson's military intervention in the region for economic reasons, he argues that he overall still supported democracy in the region. So he's justifying getting involved militarily in Mexico to try to, uh, you know, defend democracy there, not to try to further exert influence over, um, over Mexico. So again, this shows us some of the key players in the Mexican Revolution. Um, so Carranza is going to become the next president of Mexico. We'll talk about Pancho Villa in a second. Um, so um, during the Mexican Revolution, um, you're going to see that uh, there's going to be a significant challenge between the Mexican government uh, against U.S. presence there. Um, so Wilson calls for an arms embargo against the Mexican government. Um, and he sends a fleet to try to blockade the port of Veracruz in Mexico. Um, and then in 1914, several U.S. soldiers go ashore at Tamp Tampico Bay, and they get arrested by Mexican authorities. Um, and so uh, this is seen by Wilson as a violation of moral diplomacy. He makes the argument that he was just there to essentially help the Mexicans, but the president, again, we know at this point was a military dictator, Huerta. And Huerta refuses to apologize um, after a U.S. military, uh, U.S. naval officer demands him to. So basically, Wilson is insulted that Huerta not only, um, not only tried to take control of this region, but he also refuses to apologize for arresting uh, these soldiers. So Wilson retaliates by ordering the U.S. Navy to occupy Veracruz. Um, and it actually seems like the U.S. is going to go to war um, with Mexico. But um, Argentina, Brazil, and Chile offer to mediate the dispute. And um, that is successful. Um, and this actually demonstrates the first dispute in the Americas that is settled by joint uh, mediation. Okay, so um, we're almost at the end, by the way. Um, so we also have uh, a... Um, an effort to, okay, let's, let me just talk about Pancho Villa and the U.S. Expeditionary Force. So Huerta is going to fall from power in late 1914. He's going to be replaced by a more democratic regime led by, um, led by Carranza, who we saw over here. Um, so uh, Pancho Villa is going to immediately challenge this new government, um, and he's going to get together a band of rebels um, and Pancho Villa is going to lead raids across the U.S.-Mexican border. He murders several people in Texas and New Mexico. And Pancho Villa's hope is that he's going to destabilize Carranza's government. Um, but Woodrow Wilson wants to step in and try to protect Carranza's new government. Obviously, Wilson sees it as a better alternative to Huerta's dictatorship. So uh, Wilson orders this man, um, General John J. Pershing, Pershing, to conduct an expeditionary force to uh, try to get Pancho Villa in northern Mexico and capture him. Um, President Carranza is very much against the U.S. presence in Mexico. So even though, you know, Wilson is trying to get rid of Villa, who's challenging his rule, Carranza doesn't like the fact that the U.S. is intervening in Mexico. Um, in January 1917, 
um, because there's this growing possibility of the U.S. entry into World War I, uh, Wilson decides to withdraw Pershing's troops, so they never successfully capture Pancho Villa. <clears throat> This chart shows you how much uh, investments there actually are <clears throat> in Latin America. Um, and this um, also shows us the, um, how proportionally there are so many more investments in Latin America than there are in other parts of the world. <clears throat> you also see that the majority of U.S. dollars invested in Latin America are on mining and smelting. So this shows us that there are many precious metals, uh, coal in particular, that the U.S. wants to have control over in these regions. Um, this just shows us how many areas of Latin America the U.S. intervened in. So again, we see that this really shows us how much they are applying the Monroe Doctrine over the region. And then one last slide. Um, this is uh, called A Quiet Little Game. Um, we see here that um, this is Uncle Sam playing a card game. All these people here are European leaders. Um, what this shows is how easy and how fast the U.S. stopped Spain and also escalated affairs in other parts of the world. And the idea is that all these other imperialist nations like Britain, France, and Germany are just kind of going to stand by and watch while the U.S. gets increasingly involved in the imperialistic game. So see how, you know, the U.S. is holding all the chips, so to speak. Um, so this actually also, you could say, is uh, showing us how often this happens in history. We talk quite a bit about how modern uh, America is sort of acting as a world police force. And so this cartoon kind of shows us that its origins happened around the turn of the 20th century. So that's it for imperialism. Um, we're going to do more skills-based activities in class on Tuesday, so looking at primary sources, just so that we can continue and, and get uh, through the progressive era and World War I. So thank you so much for listening.